In this series of three lectures, we'll complete our study of prescription psychopharmacology by discussing the final three categories, analgesics to treat pain, stimulants used to treat ADHD, and anti-dementia agents to treat Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. In all honesty, these are not very high yield subjects for boards, but you will see these frequently on wards, so it's worth reviewing. First, we'll start with the analgesics, commonly known as painkillers. This is a broad category, covering everything from aspirin and Tylenol to Vicodin and Dilaudid, and we will attempt to briefly cover everything, although aspects of these drugs not related to pain itself, such as aspirin's effects on heart disease, for example, will not be discussed here. When going over the pharmacology of pain management, it is helpful to keep in mind the overall theme of using the least powerful option that still produces good results. The World Health Organization has created a pain ladder, which suggests starting with non-opioids such as NSAIDs, then combining NSAIDs with a weak opioid, and finally introducing a strong opioid. For the rest of this lecture, we'll start at the bottom of the pain ladder and work our way up. The first rung on the pain ladder are the NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, many of which are household names, aspirin, ibuprofen, Tylenol, Advil, Motrin, etc. As a quick review, NSAIDs work by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase, or COX enzyme, preventing the production of prostaglandins, which are molecules implicated in pain sensation. There are two different COX enzymes, isoforms 1 and 2, and the drugs we will study inhibit one or both of these. There are clinical differences between COX 1 and 2, but we won't go into these too much. Here are the major NSAIDs you'll encounter on a common basis. They have many other functions in addition to pain relief, but you'll have to learn about those elsewhere. As you can see, there are some differences between these, such as some being a reversible versus an irreversible inhibitor, or inhibiting COX-1 versus COX-2, but those are beyond the scope of our lecture. One note on the NSAIDs. There is increasing evidence that NSAIDs cause injury to the kidney, especially when used for long periods of time. Keep this in mind when working with patients who are taking these daily, and make sure to check creatinines on a regular basis. One final drug that is often lumped with the NSAIDs but is not actually an NSAID is acetaminophen, brand name Tylenol. Quick note, acetaminophen is also known as paracetamol, so don't be confused if you see that name pop up once in a while. While acetaminophen shares with the NSAIDs an ability to decrease pain and break fevers, it is not actually an anti-inflammatory agent and therefore is not an NSAID. Because it is not an NSAID, acetaminophen is actually safe for your kidneys. However, it instead has effects at the liver, as you might remember from our half acet mnemonic. As long as you don't exceed a certain dose per day, acetaminophen is a very safe drug, but don't overdo it or you could end up with some serious liver damage. Moving up the pain ladder, we next hit the opioids. Let's quickly review our mnemonic for opioid effects, the armed Chinese man from the opium wars, as all of the opiates we will cover work by modulating opioid receptors in the central nervous system. A is for analgesia. R is for respiratory depression, M is for meiosis or pinpoint pupils, E is for euphoria, D is for drowsiness, and the C from Chinese is for constipation. This table should not necessarily be memorized, but you should make an attempt to be familiar with all of the names, including brand names, and to recognize that each one is an opioid analgesic. It may pay off to be familiar with the relative potencies of each drug as well, although there are conversion charts available for converting from one opiate to another that you can look up online should the need arise. The first and most famous of the opiate analgesics is morphine. Morphine is an active ingredient in the opium poppy and has been used throughout recorded history for its pain relief properties. Since the introduction of modern medicine, morphine has been available in a concentrated form and is routinely used today as an analgesic, such as with patients presenting with chest pain from a myocardial infarction. Morphine is unique in that it is considered the standard of pain control, with nearly all of the opiates deriving from morphine in some way. One thing to note is that morphine IV is about three times as powerful as giving it in a PO form. One occasionally tested tidbit is that morphine, as well as many of the other opiates we will cover, bind to the mu subtype of opioid receptors. There are other subtypes of opioid receptors, including delta, kappa, and nociceptin, but try to remember mu for morphine. The next opiate is codeine, which you will see from the chart is actually weaker than morphine. However, because of this property, it can be used for more mild applications, such as providing mild sedation and relief via cough syrup for the common cold. The next opiate has an extensive neurotransmitter profile, which has led to the mnemonic tramadol to remind you that tramadol attempts to tram it all in. The benefit of the serotonin involvement means that tramadol has better effects at managing chronic pain issues such as rheumatoid arthritis. You don't have to memorize each neurotransmitter involved. Just know that tramadol's widespread effects make it a better choice for chronic pain.
Hydrocodone is often combined with paracetamol, which, as you'll remember, is another name for acetaminophen or Tylenol, for extra strength and sold under the trade name of Norco. Again, just know the names. Oxycodone, brand name Oxycontin or Roxycodone, is about one and a half times stronger than morphine. Just be able to recognize Oxycodone is about a medium strength opiate. Hydromorphone, brand name Dilaudid, is one that you will become familiar with after working in the ER, as its high potency, about five times greater than morphine, means it provides a particularly strong high, so drug-seeking patients will sometimes request it by name. Just remember that hydromorphone should not be a first-line agent for pain, except in very severe cases. The last of the classical opiates that we will cover is fentanyl, the most potent of the opiates that are routinely used in clinical practice. This is due to its high fat solubility, as it can easily cross the blood-brain barrier and penetrate into the CNS. Fentanyl is commonly used today as a transdermal patch, which allows for a slow release and long-term pain control. The fentanyl patch is often prescribed along with another PO opiate for breakthrough pain. As discussed before, a major problem with the routine opiate use for pain control has to do with issues of addiction and overdose. As you'll remember from the arm Chinese mnemonic, opiate use can induce feelings of euphoria, which can be powerfully addictive. There are several treatment options available for patients who have become addicted to opiates, which we will cover briefly in the next few slides. One of the solutions developed to treat patients addicted to opiates is the drug methadone, brand name Dolophine. Methadone itself is still an agonist of the opioid receptor, so what makes the difference between methadone and any other opiate? The key is in the half-life, which is approximately two to three days. With proper dosing, methadone can make the withdrawal period coming off of opiates or heroin much more tolerable, and the clinical reviews found that the use of methadone was significantly more effective than non-pharmacological treatments at promoting abstinence from heroin and other opiates. Another tool in the fight against opiate addiction is buprenorphine, brand name Suboxone. In contrast to methadone's trick of having a long half-life, buprenorphine tackles opiate addiction by having a high affinity for the opioid receptor while having a very low activity, making it a partial agonist. What this means is that the drug binds to the receptor and blocks other drugs such as morphine from binding, but does not actually activate the receptor very strongly. Because it doesn't activate the receptor, there is much less possibility for abuse or dependence when using buprenorphine, and unlike methadone, many patients can be given a 30-day outpatient supply. I remember the meaning of this drug using a little bit of internet speak. The word boop means to poke something on the nose, so I imagine buprenorphine booping morphine on the nose. It's a silly mnemonic, but remember, do whatever it takes to get the information to stick. Butorphanol, brand name Stadol, is similar to buprenorphine in that it is a partial agonist, effectively blocking the activity of stronger opiates while not activating the receptor. It's a sad mnemonic, but I read butorphanol as but orphanol, suggesting that opiates, if taken to an extreme addiction, will orphan all of the children. Because of the risks involved with chronic use of opiates, it will be helpful to briefly examine other options for treating pain. Many of these we have already discussed in other lectures, but are worth reviewing in the context of pain management. Do you remember dual oxetine and its dual mechanism? Hopefully you should also remember that dull oxetine seems to have efficacy at dulling chronic pain conditions, so keep this in mind as an option. We have also discussed the tricyclics in some depth in the antidepressant section, but remember that many tricyclics like amitriptyline or nortriptyline are also helpful for treating long-term pain conditions. While not useful as a mood stabilizer, gabapentin, brand name Durantin, has been shown to be efficacious at treating neuropathic pain, such as the pins and needles sensation experienced by diabetic patients with peripheral neuropathy. Finally, pregabalin, brand name Lyrica, is closely related to gabapentin and seems to have similar effects at treating seizures as well as neuropathic pain. As with all drugs in this category, at this stage it's mostly important just to be familiar with the names and overall what they do. Okay, next we'll move on to the stimulants, which are drugs used to treat Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. For unclear reasons, ADHD has grown into a bit of an epidemic in the United States, with 6.1% of children in America aged 4 to 17 taking a psychostimulant of some kind. There are some regional variations here, with the highest rates in the American South and the lowest in the West. Stimulants have been available as prescriptions for several decades now and have been marketed for the disorder we now call ADHD for about as long. Stimulant medications do have distinct and noticeable cognitive effects, such as an increased ability to concentrate, improved focus, and improved motivation. Many of these are helpful for controlling disruptive behaviors in the classroom and encouraging focus to perform schoolwork. You'll remember from our dopamine mnemonic that attention is one of the key functions of dopamine, so all the stimulants boost dopamine to some extent.
In addition, reviewing norepinephrine's functions should remind you that concentration and attention are also among norepinephrine's effects in the central nervous system. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that all stimulants modulate norepinephrine as well. As a class, stimulants do not vary widely, and indeed, no one stimulant has been shown to be more effective than any other, with an overall symptom response rate of about 70%. Therefore, it's not so important to know significant differences between them. For testing purposes, you only have to be able to recognize the names of stimulants, although many of them, such as Adderall or Ritalin, are well known in popular culture, so you have probably heard of them already. The amphetamines used to treat ADHD are indeed structurally and clinically related to the methamphetamines used recreationally. This can be scary for parents, as some are worried by the idea of, quote, putting their kids on drugs. The difference that you have to educate parents about is in terms of strength. While the mechanism of action of these two drugs are similar, it is the strength of the interaction that sets them apart. On the street, methamphetamines are incredibly powerful drugs that are highly addictive, but in an attenuated form, they can be helpful for treating the symptoms of ADHD. That being said, there remains a not insignificant potential for abuse, even in the weaker prescription form, which you should not underestimate when talking with parents. One noticeable side effect of stimulant use is growth restriction, as dopaminergic agents may decrease growth hormone release and shorten final adult height by as much as one and a half inches. There are several other non-stimulant medications that have proven useful in the treatment of ADHD. Overall, non-stimulants are somewhat less effective than the stimulants, with a response rate of about 50%. Again, for testing purposes, just be able to recognize the names of these drugs. Do you remember our old friend bupropion? By this point, it shouldn't surprise you that bupropion, with its effects on dopamine and norepinephrine, has shown some efficacy at treating mild forms of ADHD. Keep this in mind as an option for treatment of mild ADHD, especially for patients presenting with comorbid depressive disorders. The final drug we will cover in the stimulants category, and only very briefly, is modafinil, brand name Provigil. Modafinil is not helpful to treat ADHD, but it is a one-of-a-kind agent that seems to promote wakefulness and fight narcolepsy. In fact, the U.S. military has approved modafinil for use during lengthy Air Force missions, as they found that modafinil can keep pilots alert and maintain the normal accuracy for 40 hours without sleep, an impressive feat. Despite research, the precise mechanism of modafinil remains unknown, although both histamine and dopamine seem to be involved. This isn't high yield for boards necessarily, but some residents will use it to stay awake during long overnight call shifts, so it may be helpful to remember for yourself in the future. The final category of non-recreational psychopharmacology that we will cover are known as anti-dementia agents. These can be used in patients who have developed Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia to offset the loss of cholinergic neurons, resulting in improved memory and awareness. These are not high yield drugs, and you could probably skip this section and be just fine, but let's take a minute or two to cover it, shall we? As a quick review, remember the H from the ACH mnemonic to remind you that acetylcholine is a crucial player in learning and memory. This is a good time to review our previous mnemonic from the antipsychotic section to help us remember that Alzheimer's disease is caused by the destruction of acetylcholine releasing neurons. So basically, Alzheimer's disease equals acetylcholine down, much as Parkinson's disease is caused by dopamine going down. Knowing that much of dementia is caused by the loss of acetylcholine, it would make sense that finding a way to increase the amount of available acetylcholine could be of some benefit. Indeed, all but one of the available anti-dementia drugs works in this way, by inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, resulting in a higher amount of acetylcholine available in the synapse. However, as the disease progresses, the efficacy of these drugs is lost, as the brain stops producing any acetylcholine at all. It's not so important that you memorize this list, just be aware of their existence should you see them in an outpatient medicine, geriatrics, or neurology clinic. The last of the anti-dementia agents, and the only one that does not work as an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, is memantine, brand name Namenda. Memantine has a rather complicated neurotransmitter profile, and honestly it's beyond the scope of this lecture, but you can recognize the function of this drug by thinking of it as memortine to connect it with memories. Also, while patients will often forget the names and faces of loved ones, with Namenda, they can keep the name in the head. Like the stimulants, there are several caveats to the use of anti-dementia agents in this population. We cannot and should not promise patients or their families that these will result in any significant changes to the course of Alzheimer's disease. Indeed, no medication has shown the ability to halt or reverse the progression of Alzheimer's at this time. At best, we can promise that these drugs may or may not result in a symptomatic improvement in cognitive function, putting more lights on more often. And we're done with the prescription drugs. When we come back, we'll start going over the recreational drugs.